It's my cousin's 50th birthday coming up and I wanted to make him something special to mark the occasion. In today's video we'll be using some exotic materials, some unusual machines and some interesting techniques to create a one of a kind personalised wine bottle stopper and case. This is African blackwood. It grows in the dry savanna regions of Central and Southern Africa and can be considered to be the original ebony, having been imported and used in ancient Egypt thousands of years ago. Although technically it is in the rosewood family and the name ebony is now reserved for other species of woods. Today it's mostly used for the production of high-end woodwind instruments such as clarinets and oboes. Hence you often find it in blanks shaped like this. This would have been a blank for a clarinet end bell, believe it or not. African blackwood is considered to be among the hardest and densest of all woods, and it's very difficult to work using hand tools due to the extreme blunting effect on cutters. Therefore, it's most often used in turned objects where it's considered to be among the very finest of all turning woods, capable of holding threads and other intricate details well, as you can see from this ornamentally turned test piece. Due to the properties of the wood, it machines more like metal or hard engineering plastic like Delrin. Hence, I'm going to be using the engineering lathe to machine this today. And we'll get to that just a little bit later in the video. To create some contrast with that African blackwood, I'm going to be using these sterling silver plates. They're half a millimetre thick by 40 millimetres square. And we should be inserting one into both the bottle stopper and the case itself. I'd like to personalise this piece by engraving those silver plates and to do that I'm going to be using a pantograph. A pantograph is essentially a copying machine that uses a four bar linkage arranged into a parallelogram with a stylus at one end of the mechanism and a diamond tip scriber at the other. Brass letters are loaded into the tracks on the front of the machine and are followed with a stylus. Meanwhile the engraving tip is pushed down into the work and the motion of the stylus is transferred through the mechanism to the engraving tip which scribes a line into the workpiece. By adjusting the distance between the pivot points on the linkage the text can be reduced in size and in the case of this machine we can achieve a reduction of between 2.5 and 6 times. Now the great thing about a pantograph is that you're not just restricted to lettering. That stylus will follow any two dimensional track. So I've gone ahead and 3D printed some templates, one with his initials and the other with the number 50. So let's go ahead and get our silver plates engraved. I'm reasonably pleased with the way that the engravings have come out, but the next thing to do is to make them easier to mount to the wood. Rather than square plates, I'd like them to be round discs. So I have a plan to mount them to this piece of aluminium and turn each of the engravings into a small coin which will be easier to mount in the wood. I'd like to trim the corners off these square plates before mounting them to the aluminium. And to do that, I'm going to use the shear on my small three-in-one sheet metal machine. I've prepped the surface of both the aluminium slug and the back of the plate and I'm going to attach them with super glue. I 
I've mounted the slug in the four jaw chuck and I've trued it up uh, as best as I can by eye. Obviously there's no uh, surface here that I can run an indicator on so um, I've had to do it by eye and I think it's close enough for what we're doing here. I've brought that coin to size now and we need to part it off from the slug. So I'm just using some isopropyl alcohol here to lubricate the cut. That's our coin machine to size now, but I do still need to face off the back of it and uh, work holding is gonna be a bit challenging here. So what I've done is I've taken one of these uh, 5C step collets with a machinable head and I've machined a recess into that to the uh, diameter that I need to hold the coin. Going to move on to making the body of the wine bottle stopper now. And I've been digging through my uh, scrap bin and I found a piece of blackwood that looks like it's just the ticket. It's approximately the right size and it's already got a hole bored down the centre. So I can use that to fit the stainless steel piece which will actually fit into the bottle. And I'm going to open up the top there so that I can set the coin into the top of the bottle stopper. So over to the lathe now and I'm going to be using an insert there that's designed to cut aluminium. It's a very sharp insert and it, uh, it works well on this blackwood. I start by cleaning up the end here. This is going to be the underside of the head of the bottle stopper. I then move on to boring the centre to precisely 20 millimetres. Just a note on wood dust and shavings. The dust from this blackwood is very abrasive and it gets everywhere. Um, it took me a long time to clean the machine after I uh, finished this project. A better method would be to mock up some kind of dust extraction. And a friend of mine has done exactly that, as you can see here. He's mocked up this bracket to hold a shop vac on the tool post and it appears to work extremely well. I do have a flaw in the wood there, so I'm gonna turn this round in the lathe now and just skim that outside and try and get rid of that. When it's freshly machined, this blackwood uh, is a bit lighter in colour than it is normally, but it does darken up again quite quickly, uh, normally within a couple of hours. Uh, I'm assuming that the uh, oils are seeping out of the interior of the wood back to the surface layers. I'm facing off the end there just to bring the part to the, uh, the, the length that I desire, just something that looks aesthetically pleasing. And then I'm gonna move on to boring the center out to fit that coin. So this is where we are with the uh, head of the bottle stopper for now. There is still more work to be done. Still need to make the shaft of the bottle stopper and do some more clean up on this, on this piece of wood, but we'll get to that a bit later. In the meantime, I'm gonna start on the case. I'll be using this piece of African blackwood that I have. I've cleaned up the ends and uh, the next job is to clean up the OD. 
I'll start with just some rough cuts by hand just to uh, knock the uh, tops off and bring the uh, piece of wood roughly into shape. And then um, I'll go back in with the power feed and do a, a powered run that gives us our nice finish. And now we've got something resembling a cylinder, I need to divide it into two pieces, one for the top of the box and one for the bottom. And we'll be using the woodcutting bandsaw to do that. I've made the base piece slightly bigger than the uh, lid piece because we're going to need to machine a lip into the top of this that will fit into the bottom of the lid and hold it in place. Now I'm going to machine the lid and the base of this box. These are going to be very similar operations, um, the only difference being the, the lip uh, on the base that will fit into the recess in the cap. You'll see that uh, shortly. And there's a couple of ways I could have approached this, right? So um, one of the ways that I could have done this would be to simply hollow out the middle of this solid piece of wood, leaving the top in, in place that we can set the coin into. But I didn't want to go down that road because I wanted to um, find a more efficient way of using this material. It's quite expensive and quite difficult to come by African blackwood. So I didn't want to just go and bore a load of material out in the middle of that piece that would end up as uh, wood chips in the pan. So instead, I'm going to try and trepan the middle of this piece of wood out. And I think I've got some hole saws that should allow us to do that. That should leave us with a cylinder that will form the walls of the box lid um, and then I can simply make a cap for the top and we should have a slug of wood that will be left over that we can use for a different project. Now I've not done this before so I don't really know at this point how this is going to turn out. I'm using these hole saws with carbide tips as opposed to my regular hole saws because they've got a much deeper throat depth on them which is going to allow me to get all the way through that piece of wood in one go without having to flip it round. But yeah, it remains to be seen whether they're actually going to cut through this wood or just sit there and rub. I guess we're about to find out. And yeah, I'm getting quite a lot of rubbing from those wide carbide teeth, but I'm also getting chips, so it is doing something. And that seems to have worked just fine. So on to the next op. And I've actually switched over to the slightly longer blank for the base here because I want to machine the lip before I machine the recess in the part that we've just been working on. I think it's going to be easier to get the fit I want if I do it in that order. So I've prepared the blank in exactly the same way as that last one and I'm about to start machining that lip. Now we've got the walls of the base complete with that lip, we're going to go back to the lid and machine the recess. I'm periodically checking the diameter of that, uh, that recess with the bore gauges to make sure that we don't overshoot it. And now we're getting close, I'm going to just chamfer the edge before we do a test fit. And that is just the fit I'm looking for. It's tight enough that it doesn't wobble around, but loose enough that the parts can slide together quite easily. And now we move on to machining the end caps for the base and the top.
and that's a good fit. So I'm going to part it off on the bandsaw, flip it round and face off the other side. Off camera, I bought out that central section to accept our coin. And then the end cap gets epoxied onto the walls of the lid, just so. I've gone ahead and done the same for the base, and that's our case pretty much complete for now. I will have to come back to this later and make an insert to hold the bottle stopper securely, but in the meantime, we need to continue work on the bottle stopper itself, and this is where we are right now. Now, I've recently become interested in a technique called ornamental turning, and I'm lucky enough to be the custodian of a beautiful antique ornamental turning lathe on loan from the Society of Ornamental Turners. So I'm going to use this machine to try and put a pattern in the side of this workpiece. Now this doesn't quite go to plan for reasons that will become apparent later in the video, but I thought I'd leave the footage in because I think it's an interesting technique and it gives you guys a chance to see this beautiful old machine in action. I'll set the workpiece up and what we're going to be doing today is creating a basket work pattern using this uh, rotary tool here that's known as a cutting frame. It's powered by that urethane belt that you see and is advanced in and out of the work to make the cut. We then use the built-in indexing head to advance the work a given number of holes before making another cut and this gives us the basis of our basket work pattern. The cutting frame itself is held by this device and it's called an ornamental slide rest. The depth of cut is controlled by the screw on the right there and then the infeed of the uh, tool is controlled by the screw on the left. Now that we've completed one complete revolution of our pattern, we need to advance the tool along the workpiece. And we do this by moving our ornamental slide rest 100 thou, which happens to be the exact width of the cutter that we're using for this pattern. We want the next row to be offset by 50% and uh, I've been using a four hole spacing pattern on this, uh, on this first row. So we offset that by two holes and that should give us our 50% offset. So this basket work pattern that I'm doing here is probably one of the simplest things you can do with an ornamental turning lathe. These machines were often shipped with a whole range of chucks, cutting frames and other accessories and are capable of producing myriad designs and patterns. In terms of materials that you can cut with an ornamental turning lathe, close grained hardwoods are preferable, things that will hold a pattern, i.e. things like this African blackwood, boxwood, lignum vitae, things like that. Um, in past centuries, ivory was very popular, but of course is now banned. Um, you can use industrial plastics like um, Delrin and so on and so forth. And I've even seen people cut softer metals such as aluminium and brass. This particular machine was made by a company called Holt Sattful & Co based in London and was sold in 1837 for the princely sum of 18 pounds. Now when you consider at the time you could buy a house for not a lot more money than that, this was obviously a reserve of wealthy gentlemen and the landed gentry. Now you don't necessarily need vintage equipment in order to do ornamental turning. It is possible, I have seen good results with, um, converted engineering lathes. And um, if there is any interest in ornamental turning, please let me know in the comments and I'll make more videos on this machine specifically and on ornamental turning in general. And if you think you might be interested in ornamental turning or in vintage machinery in general, I can't recommend highly enough joining the Society of Ornamental Turners. By being a member, I've learned a huge amount. I've met some incredible people and I've had my eyes open to a whole new world of vintage machinery, tools and techniques. 
I'll leave a link in the description and if you do decide to join then I very much look forward to seeing you at one of our physical or virtual meets. So I'm quite pleased with the results here and there's only one more operation needed to complete this part and that's to part off that piece of wood at the bottom that I've been using for work holding. And of course this is where things go pear shaped. I didn't get it on film but uh, as I was parting the uh, that piece off um, the workpiece flew out of the chuck, it wasn't secured properly and I damaged it. As you can see here some of the tops have been knocked off those crests and unfortunately this part is scrap. But hey ho, it wouldn't be a Jonesy makes video without something going wrong right? So our only option really is to remake that part and luckily I have that slug that we trepanned out earlier on. Which of course is just about the right size to fit in our case. So I won't bore you with all the details, many of the operations are exactly the same as we did earlier on. But the only difference being uh, is I put this onto a mandrel to, uh, to skim the outside face. Now I'm running out of time for this project, this needs to be done in two days time. So now I face a bit of a dilemma. Do I spend the time ornamentally turning the outside of this piece or do I leave it plain? I actually really like the plain look and thinking about it, the minimalist design aesthetic might fit better with my cousin's tastes. So that's what I'm going to go for. I'm just going to leave it plain. But let me know what you think in the comments. Do you think I've made the right choice? It's a tough one. And there's only one more part to make now and that's the metal bit for the bottle stopper itself. I've made this in two parts from 304 stainless steel. The first part I cut some grooves in at slightly different depths. These are to accept o-rings that hopefully will seal the bottle stopper in the in the wine bottle and the reason I did them at different depths is to account for different sized bottles. Hopefully uh, that will taper slightly towards the top. This part screws onto the mandrel that's actually going to be fixed to the piece of wood and in this shot I'm machining a big fat taper just to blend the two parts together and make it look nice. I've removed the end piece and extended the mandrel part out in the chuck and we just need to part that off and turn it around and clean up the other end to complete this part. Now with the two pieces locked tightly together we just fit the o-rings. And that's that part complete, ready for assembly. And it's time now to epoxy everything together. And that's our bottle stopper finished. I'm reasonably pleased with the way it turned out. I like the contrast between the sterling silver and the African blackwood there. And it's got a decent weight in the hand which makes it feel like a quality item. I also made an insert for the base which gives it more mass and holds the bottle stopper in place. And of course we have our engravings which gives it a little bit of a personal touch. The stopper fits in a wine bottle really well and there's very little in the way of play or movement. I'm quite pleased with the overall fit and finish and everything's got a real kind of weighty chunky feel to it which is uh, quite satisfying. Now I set myself four objectives when I started this project. Number one, I wanted to make something that was unique, something that couldn't be bought in the shops and I think no matter what your opinion of this piece, we've met that criteria. Number two, I wanted to make it personal to my cousin and I think with those engravings we've achieved that. The third thing I wanted to do was to make sure that it had a premium feel and I think with the silver and the black wood and the weight of the object I think we got close to achieving that too. And finally, I wanted it to look good. And it's not for me to say if I hit that one. Now, of course, uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And this, for sure, isn't going to be to everybody's tastes. Let me know what you think in the comments. All that's left now is to wrap this up and give it to my cousin for his birthday tomorrow.
Well, this has been quite a journey and an enjoyable one at that, and it's been great having you guys along for the ride. If you'd like to support the channel, please do check out my Patreon and my website, links in the description, and I'll catch you on the next one.